Okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here, and I'm going to be going over the 10-game uh, main slate we have here on Friday, June 23. Um, interesting slate, of course, as always, and some cool kind of tournament um, decisions I think we can make. Now, we've got uh, projections and ownership loaded, of course, as always, on the site and pushing to uh, Sabersim. Um, so feel free to jump in and start building teams. Um, you know, you're going to have to balance kind of the uh, the red and white winged elephant in the room, so to speak, um, in the Angels at Coors Field against Kyle Freeland tonight. A lot of ownership going to come to them naturally. And maybe one more real obvious spot uh, or pretty heavy ownership spot, that's Toronto against Cap. In Toronto, um, so they're going to see some ownership too, and then everybody else at the moment pretty spread out. Uh, so I think we can probably try and and spread out ourselves a little bit, get to some decent tournament spots, and uh, same thing on the mound here. I think there might be some exploitable ownership um, inefficiencies, right, that we could kind of go after here. And we'll get into that as we get into the games, right? So let's uh, let's just start. We had some weather today. Let's start there, right? Um, here in the Texas Yankee game, we also have to worry about it in Baltimore uh, and in Philly. So, right, it's these first three games on the docket. Everywhere else should be pretty good to go. Uh, it looks like you might have to worry about some kind of you know, fishy pop-up storms or whatever in Colorado happens quite a bit in the afternoon sometimes there at Coors. But most of all, it's just these three games up here. Everybody else should be good. Um, a while to go yet until we'll be able to really see how these storms are going to develop. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if one or even more, you know, more than one of these games um, is is postponed or delayed or something, you know, so we're going to have to deal with some stuff. Only a couple of spots that you really might want to get to anyway, I think. Um, so we'll, uh, let's just kind of go over it and we'll start with Texas and the Yankees. This is kind of one of those spots I would like to get to personally, right? I want to play Texas again. I want to play them every night. Um, I want to go after Clark Schmidt. Looks like that's who it's going to be now. Earlier in the uh, in the morning here, the Yankees, or uh, at least DraftKings, they they did have uh, Luis Severino. Um, most places everywhere, including MLB, have Clark Schmidt. So it looks like it's going to be him. So there could there could be a little bit of confusion though because they both threw on the same day five days ago because they had a doubleheader. So um, looks like it's going to be Clarky though, and I want to go after that with. Uh, with the Rangers, right? Super high-powered offense against right-handed pitching. And this is a below-average right-hander, 118 WRC+, plus, average strikeout rate, a lot of power, very high hard contact rate, 37% in aggregate. And they get it on the line and hit it in the air. So let's do this at Yankee Stadium. Average righty, as I mentioned, 311 ISO to the left side of the plate here, 391 WOBA with a 208 ISO allowed. Against lefties, I don't think so. I'm not going to be doing this. Like, he's tried to mix in this cutter with Clarky, but he's still throwing a lot of this two-seamer, and he's not getting value out of either one of them. Right? Where's the value? Um, Break-even curveball here, and this is like the sweeper, right? Which gives him whiffs against the right side. So against right-handed heavy lineups, yeah, we want to do that. Against bad lineups, yeah, that's in play. But he still gives up some pop, right? With a 180 realized X or ISO to the right side. Um, 170 ISO, X ISO in aggregate, attackable figure, right? We've talked about that before. Um, mostly it's left-handers though, that I want to get to from Texas. And that's the usual suspects. Corey Seager up to 6,400 now. That's, you know, I mean, now we're talking, this is where he should be. Um, and now you got to make decisions, right? 4,200 for Nate Lowe. You don't really have to make a decision there. Just play him. Same thing with Jonah Heim. 4,400, kind of stiff price tag, but you can do the same thing with uh, Leody Tavares. Um, you can even play, like I said, some of these right-handers. Mitch Garver, he'll get the baseball in the air here. 
Uh, Josh Young, 4,700, not jacked about this price. And he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup. Garcia in the outfield, he's fine at 55. Semi in 61. So, like, they're not cheap, don't get me wrong. So it kind of takes me off of, um, you know, outsized exposures with Texas. But I, I do want to go after Clark Schmidt. It's mostly the price tags that are going to keep my ownership down and the weather, of course. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that this game just gets rained out and I don't have to deal with it. Um because I would much rather play another team that we'll get to uh, a little bit later. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of lukewarm on on a lot of the offense in this game. I don't really want to go after Dane Dunning necessarily with the Yankees either. Um, now, he's 5,700 for Texas. If we didn't have any weather concerns to worry about, I think this would maybe put him in play because the Yankees are bad, man. This is a terrible, terrible offense. Um, they got shut out again yesterday or damn near shut out again. Um, like, Stanton is hitting 105 or 110 since he came off the DL. Uh, Donaldson doing the same thing. The only capable hitter, like Anthony Rizzo, has been slumping for a month and a half. The only capable hitter in this lineup with any consistency right now is Glaber Torres. Um, like, DJ has been out a little while because he's been dreadful this season. Um, you know, so they're keeping him out of the lineup, and they're missing Judge, of course, still. So th this, unless they're hitting the baseball over the wall with, like, Jake Bowers, right, or the occasional Billy McKinney dinger. Um, like nobody is scoring for, for the Yankees over here. They just can't do anything. They can't create. And when they're not hitting for power, they're just striking out a lot. They're not walking. I mean, outside of Rizzo, he walks all the time, but um, you know, this is a really bad offense. So that might even put Dane Dunning in play and at 5,700. Like he's got a 30 value score here. This is not nothing. The problem with Dunning, like, you can't really get excited with him. He's only got a 15% K rate. He's very efficient with the fastball mix here, sinker, cutter. This has been an excellent cutter pitch for him um, against the lefties this year, really suppressing a lot of the power. 050 ISO to the lefties. Damn good number there. It's just that he doesn't strike anybody out. So if he gives up any production in pitching to 82% contact – then it's really, really difficult for him to make that back up. So um, not overly thrilling to play Dane Dunning a lot of the time. 5,700, I think a little bit of this risk is priced in because this offense over here is terrible. So if we didn't have any weather to worry about, maybe you could play some Dane Dunning. I don't really want to play any of the Yankees. I mean, Rizzo's still a, you know, well-priced at 4,000, and this is still Yankee Stadium. Like, you still play... I mean, you want to pay 40 a normal price tag for Stanton when he's striking out at a 35% clip or 40% clip since he came back and, and hitting a buck 10. I, I mean, I don't want to deal with that. Um, he's got to show me that he could turn this around. When he gets cold, he gets really, really cold, and you just want to stay completely away from him, especially when his price tag's high. So they're fine price wise in aggregate like jake bowers 2700 that's fine whatever right but you really want to go after dane dunning with a bunch of lefties here even at yankee stadium i mean i don't really because he still gets a good number of ground balls here buck 40 in aggregate keeps it on the ground for the most part and doesn't give up a lot of power so he's very serviceable i think at 5700 um it's low enough ownership that if we didn't have to worry about weather and real just raw upside, I think he, that would put him in play for me at, you know, 15, 20% or something like that to make some things happen. But, um, and to get different, because you're going to need to get different tonight in particular. So it's, it, he's in play, but like, bleh, I don't really want to deal at all with Clark, Clark Schmidt. Um, like I said, I hope the game just kind of gets rained out and I don't have to deal with any of, this, any of these shenanigans. Let's move on. Mets and Philly. Could I Senga? I'm not dealing with this either. Like, he's still 10,000. He still walks 28 guys at a start. Like, I cannot do it. I understand that, you know, he's got the strikeout stuff to get out of those holes, but it's still just the pitch count, elevating the pitch count. He's 10,000, right? And unless he can stop throwing so many damn pitches, like, th there's no way that he's going to be able 
to to get to a, a regular six plus because he's got strikeout stuff which elevates pitch count and then he's got walks which elevates pitch count right so it caps his upside in being able to go deep enough into games he's got what four outings five one two three four five outings this season of his 13 starts that have been north of 20 dk points yeah sure two of them have been north of 30 one of them at 28 the other two at you know 24 26 whatever those are serviceable starts right but the problem is the walks right and there's been three of these outings three of these starts this year where he has walked one batter one batter or zero batters right and even in the start where he walked one batter the most recent one right against st louis he still gave up four runs struck out eight that's that's awesome and you only walked one that's awesome but you gave up four runs right and you only popped for 19 points in the other outing where he only walked one he gave up five runs right so he's trying a little bit here to stay so far down in the strike zone and get swing and miss that when he doesn't like when he starts throwing more strikes he just pitches to way too much contact right and then he gets blown apart right because look at the contact figures 36 percent in aggregate here 191 iso allowed to the right side right very, very good still against lefties because the split is still a good pitch, but where's the elite value on it? It's just not there, right? Where's the elite value on the slider or sweeper, whatever the hell he's throwing, right? It's just not there, right? He's got one good pitch here that's the cutter that's really suppressing a lot of contact, getting ground balls to the left side, but everything else is break even with walks, and that makes it super difficult for me to play him. I mentioned this with him every start. And I think this is a, a sneaky bad matchup for him. Now, a couple of these lefties, they're going to strike out, right? Harper's been striking out a lot recently. Schwarber, he's been striking out all season. Um, Price-wise, I don't want to play Senga because of the variance that he brings upon himself. Um, and he's too expensive for me to stomach that. I like the ownership, yeah. Does he have strikeout upside in this particular matchup if he doesn't walk anybody? Yeah. Um but I'm just going to have to leave him on the shelf. So until he, like, he's an $8,500 arm here, given this walk rate. And it, it, like I said, it's not like it's a, a super inconsistent walk rate. You know, he's walking three batters every damn start. So I, I just I just can't do it at this particular price tag. There's some other guys I'd rather play. Um, and I don't really want to go after Philly, generally. They can capitalize, certainly. They got guys that will hit the baseball over the wall, they can they haven't really shown it this year so far overall 102 wrc plus average k rate average hard contact average power etc etc average creation offense and they're expensive too so i don't really want to stack against senga even though it puts them in play because he walks people um it's it's their price tags that's really going to take me off and of course the weather here 5600 for schwarber he's going to strike out a lot in this matchup and he's going to walk a lot in this matchup so that's basically two of those at bats that you could just throw out the window for schwarber right and sanga didn't give up a lot of power so kind of at 5600 kind of got to come off of that you hope that sanga just walks the whole country and then schwarber gets two or even three abs against a bullpen I don't know. Seems pretty unlikely. So 56, I'm going to come off of that. 5,800 for Trey Turner. You want to play this? I, I I don't want to do this. He's way too expensive. He's not stealing. He's only got 13 bags this year. Can't get on base. He's hitting like 240, right, with a sub-700 OPS. And you want to pay 5,800 for him in this matchup? I don't really, right? There's hard contact and, and ISO allowed from Senga, right? But where is Trey's upside this season? Um, pretty stiff to be ta paying that price tag. Castellanos, price adjusted. He's my favorite here, 4300 Harper, you can always play, of course, at 6000 Like I said, he's striking out. He's probably going to whiff a good bit here, too. JTR, I'd probably, if I'm going to pay above 5 k for a right-hander, it's going to be for JTR, not Trey Turner. Um, even though I don't really, like, he's got better production numbers, and he, he's got 10 bags himself this season, whereas Trey's only got, what, 13. So, um, not super thrilled about playing the Phillies either, to be quite honest. If I got to choose, it's it's like a Castellanos Harper JTR stack or something like that, because um, I would much rather, in terms of contact, rather play the righties, right? 
But I don't really want to do that. They're not going to hit for a lot of average. You're just kind of hoping they run into a ball with a couple runners on. Which is possible, but at those price tags, you're kind of priced out from that sort of upside. So not super interested in offense there against Kodai Senga, even though I'm fading him. Taiwan Walker on the mound. If I'm going to choose full stacks, it's got to be with the Mets, but I don't want to play these guys either. They're terrible, right? He's got a pretty equitable um, sinker-cutter split mix, right, that keeps him down in the strike zone. He gets some ground balls, and a lot of the better hitters right, from the Mets, at least from the left side, right, are ground ball hitters. Nimmo, Frankie Lindor, not so much, but Jeff McNeil, no power there. High contact guy, ground ball hitter. Um, that's where most of the power is coming, but really, he's not giving up all that much power. He's attackable, 170 XI, so sure, but it's just 30% hard contact rates. He induces a good bit of soft from the righties. That's with the split, too, right? So, not super attackable. He pitches to a lot of contact, don't get me wrong. And he's got some walks in him at an aggregate 10%. So that puts some of the Mets here in play. I like the price tag on Frankie Lindor, 4500 I like Petey at 51 pretty much always. Tommy fan has been great recently. Outside of that, I'm not really thrilled about playing Starling Marte. He's hitting 240 himself. He is stealing bases. But... He's got three jacks on the year. There's just no ISO from him anymore. Same thing with Nimmo. So if I had to choose like a three or a four man even, it'd be like a Nimmo, Lindor, Pete Alonzo, Tommy Pham. Um, if you throw in a five man, maybe a Marte or a, a Jeff McNeil. You could play a Frankie Alvarez behind the plate. I think that's okay. He's going to swing out of his shoes here. Fine. Um, but you're going to want mostly line drive and guys that could get the baseball in the air here, and that's Kind of Frankie Lindor and Pete Alonso for the most part. A little bit of Frankie Alvarez. So, uh, overly lukewarm on this game, pretty much all around. Don't really want to play Taiwan Walker. He doesn't have the upside I'm looking for in this particular matchup with the strikeouts. Likely to get tagged for a run or a couple runs. Not super likely to go way deep into the game. Not interested there. Not playing Kodai Senga, right? And the price tags on the Phillies too high, and the Mets are a bad offense. So hopefully this game just gets, gets rained out also. I don't have to worry about that. Let's move on. Seattle and Baltimore. Logan Gilbert on the mound. I think I want to play some of this here. Now, initially you're going to balk at the price tag, right? 9,800. Oh, is Baltimore. Um, you know, whatever. I think this is a playable spot, uh, certainly at 7% ownership. I think this Median projection is too low so far. What worries me, we do have some concerns, obviously, um, is hard contact to left side, right? 40% hard and 080 ground ball to fly ball. A lot of fly balls here. And Camden is going to play up left-handed power a little bit more than right-handed power. Um, this is, you know, weather agnostic, okay? So that worries me a little bit. And combine that with price tag, you know, that, that would naturally have to just kind of take me off a little bit. But he's got elite control, right? Does Gilbert, 5% walk rate. He'll get onto the barrel. That's the that's the 40% hard to the lefties mostly. But he does it to righties a little bit sometimes as well. Excuse me. And that's with this four-seamer, right? He can get onto uh, a little bit too much loud contact from the righties, and that's what translates into a 172 ISO allowed. But they don't hit for a lot of average, really, to both sides. 243 XBA allowed. With a 300 x Woba, 171 x ISO. Talked about this though. Anything above 170, it's kind of an attackable figure and something you got to take note of. Where I'm really attracted though is the solid strikeout rates, really to both sides, and he doesn't walk anybody, right? So he's got decent chase, 31%. I think we could get away with, um, you know, a bigger ballpark, stomaching a little some hard contact here. But don't give it like I. Do not like 40% hard contact with fly balls, right? So that's worrisome for sure, but that's pretty much it. I'm looking for a little bit of positive strand rate regression for sure for Logan Gilbert, 64%. That's a really low number. He's got a 430 ERA with expected metrics, you know, about a run lower. So looking for some positive regression, definitely in the hard contact rate as well, because with the elite splitter value, this hard contact rate should be quite a bit lower. He throws a slider to him also, and he's got a fine and break-even curveball, right? So he's got whiffs in the tank. That's where I'm mostly attracted, because the guys at the top of the lineup for Baltimore, Gunner, Rutch, not going to strike out, Gunner, Santander, Ryan O'Hearn, Austin Hayes, all these guys are going to strike out. Hicks, a little bit lower, but he stinks. 
and everybody down at the bottom of the lineup you're not super worried about necessarily. Adam Frazier, Ramon Urias, and Georgie Mateo. Um, so I'm kind of on Gilbert here a little bit. I really like the ownership here, and I think this high price tag is going to, in the general matchup, right? Baltimore's still a pretty good offense against right-handed pitching. 104, WRC+, plus, 22% K rate, some hard, a little bit of power. Dangerous, for sure. And they've got a lot of platoon bats that they're going to go to work with. All that's going to keep his ownership down. Um, and I really doubt that with Logan Webb, who we'll get to, could I say, is even seeing ownership... That Logan, I really doubt that Logan Gilbert's going to see uh, north of 10% by the time we get into lock here. So I like this as a tournament play. I think there's a good bit of upside. He has 25 in the tank, and I'm okay with that today uh, on the mound. Kyle Gibson on the other side, 8,100 for him. I think he's overpriced um, in this matchup. I really don't like playing Kyle Gibson because he's super hard for me to figure out. Um, I, I, I've spent years trying to dig into Kyle Gibson, and it's just I'm smashing my head in the door trying to get him right this season right good two seamer good change good slider value okay he's got three pitches that he's going to work with there and getting value out of however he's giving it all right back with bad four seamer value bad cutter value bad curveball value right so that's two and a half outs that he's given right back to the field of the three and a half outs that he's gaining with the sinker slider change so overall right he's just a break even um you know, a break-even arm, and that makes sense. He, he really always has been. Uh, even though he's got some stuff in the tank and he throws six pitches, that can make him kind of div- div- difficult to stack against sometimes. Um, he's still just a break-even arm, right? Nothing overly impressive, certainly not in the whiffs, right? Still gives up average to lefties, 276, 339 Woba with a 172 ISO, right? X ISO in aggregate, he's at a 178, right? So he's probably running a little bit hot, to be honest, in the suppression compared to where he should be, right? 335 X Woba with a roughly average 311 X Woba. So about two and a half ticks hot there. Same thing in the ISO category. Few ticks hot, 258 average um, allowed or whatever, 254 here, right? With a 269 XBA, couple of ticks off. Right, so looking for a little bit of negative regression for Kyle Gibson. I mean, he's hovering right in the range, suppression-wise, with where he should be, uh, batted ball, or based on the batted ball metrics. He's attackable with some hard contact to the right side. He gets some ground balls to the lefties, you know, so he's he's really up and down because he's got so much. So I'm not super thrilled about playing in Seattle, but if I had to choose a stack in this game, it's not the expensive guys on the other side that are going to platoon against Logan Gilbert. It's Seattle that's not really going to platoon here against Kyle Gibson because Kyle Gibson is a, a far worse arm, right? So give me JP at, at uh, 3,300, rather, leading off. I think this is fine. Julio at 54. He's also got some pretty down numbers this year, but I think this is an upside spot for him. You still got to pay for it. It's no bargain. But the other guys, Ty France, Tay Oscar in particular, I like this spot for him. Jared Kelnick, Cal Raleigh, of course, uh, from the left side. And Gino Suarez, 3,500. You can play all of these guys. Uh, even Mike Ford and uh, Josie Caballero, at second and shortstop eligibility down at the bottom of the lineup. They are in play as well. So I think Seattle is a really off the board and kind of sneaky stack here. Um, I'm not interested in playing Kyle Gibson. I just rarely play him. Sometimes he pops for 25 and 30, and they're bad against right-handed pitching, the Mariners. So could that put him in play? Sure. 26% K rate, no creation. Julio's not even stealing a hell of a lot this year. So, yeah, I'm just, yeah. You know, hope just kind of a write-off game. I don't really like much of anything here outside of Logan Gilbert. I don't want to play anybody on the other side from Baltimore. Maybe it would be like a Rutch, Santander, Ryan O'Hearn or something. But you want to pay a full price for Rutch? Santander, I mean, yeah, he's going to switch it. So will Rutch, but like 4600 and a kind of a down matchup? I don't know. Not super jacked about that. Ryan O'Hearn, price adjusted, would be my favorite, but he's Ryan O'Hearn. So... Mostly Logan Gilbert here. Hopefully, they just postpone all of these games here and we'll have to deal with it. Okay, let's move to the fun stuff here. Uh, Oakland and Toronto. Caprillion on the mound for the A's. 5,200. Now, 5,200 is going to put him in play in a lot of matchups. I don't think this is going to be one of them necessarily. Um, 
even though he's better against right-handers, right? 276 average allowed, that's not a good number. 340 Woba, that's not a good number. But a buck 12 ISO, that's a pretty damn good number, to be quite honest. 22% strikeout rate to the right-handers. That's average. I mean, it's a tick below average, but it's not bad, right? Not what you would expect. And historically, Caprillion's been really, really bad against both sides of the plate. For the most part, it's gotten a lot of the hard contact issues under control this season, and he's not nearly on he's not on the barrel nearly as much, I should say, as he was last year, for example. Down like three, four ticks or whatever. To just a seven percent aggregate barrel rate. It's really strong. The problem still with Cap is a lot of production to the left side. Two seventy five average there, three eighty two Woba, far higher there, and a two thirty five XI so with a sixteen percent strikeout rate. It's walks as well, really to both sides. So he's putting people on base from both sides of the plate not striking out any lefties, and pitching to a lot of hard contact, 36%, with a hell of a lot of fly balls to both sides of the plate. 060 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate. So he's got a 180 X ISO, 243 XBA, and a 339 X Woba. These are attackable figures, definitely. It's mostly with left-handers, but this is a really, really dangerous team against right-handed pitching in Toronto, and they're all at very playable price tags. They're certainly... It's warranted that they're coming in with the second most ownership today. I think it makes a good bit of sense. And price adjusted, it's got to be Brandon Belt that's the favorite here at 2,500. He got he's got dual eligibility now, first and outfield. Um, he'll probably be in the three hole. And even though he's striking out at a ridiculous like 38% clip or something this season, Cap's not necessarily going to do that. So. It's a good spot for him. He's still hitting the baseball hard and hitting it in the air. Um, so that's a, a fine batted ball matchup for him because he's, or for Belt, that is, because Cap's still giving up some hard contact. But all the righties, yeah, definitely. Uh, Springer, Bichette, Vladdy, Matt Chapman, they've really only got, what, three pure fly ball hitters. That's Varsho, that's Brandon Belt, and Matt Chapman. Danny Jansen, I guess. Um that are, you know, pure fly ball hitters, right, that are going to match up pretty poorly in, in terms of, you know, the grab ball, fly ball split here. But they're still going to make a lot of really hard and, and good contact. I think that puts them squarely in play. But don't be surprised if Cap survives here a little bit. He's sometimes very hard to stack against because he gives up so many fly balls. Um, if he's off the barrel a little bit here, this could help him survive. He's not going to go deep, so it makes me really uh, uncomfortable clicking in 5200 and playing him um but if i land on a couple of these teams i don't think it's the craziest thing in the world i mean it, let's not get it confused it's really crazy and i probably won't do it because this is a very dangerous offense but uh it's in play i think um chris bassett on the mound i think this is less in play than 24 or 25 percent ownership is suggesting here I don't want to deal with this. You look at these numbers against left-handers. 175 hitters this year, 285 average allowed. That's a huge number. 416 Woba with a 331 ISO allowed. Out of control bad. 21% strikeout rate, 10% walk rate, 075 ground ball to fly ball, 37% hard. Every single metric here is terrible from the left side. I, I want to go after this with Oakland, and they're popping once again in value. It, it's, again, because they're cheap. This is a damn good spot for a lot of their lefties. Ryan Noda and Seth Brown in particular, J.J. Blade, Jace Peterson. You could even play Tony Kemp here and not throw up in your mouth while you're doing it. Um, Tyler Wade they just brought up, and they'll have him from the left side as well. He's super cheap. Every single one of these guys is 3,300 or less. And 3,300 is Asturi Ruiz, who leads the majors at solo bases. So let's do it. I want I want to get to some Oakland here. And if we want to get to some expensive guys on the mound, and I think we or some expensive stacks, I think this is how we can do it. They're really not going to be all that popular because they never really are. But I think this is a killer spot for Seth Brown, a killer spot for Ryan Noda. Same with J.J. Blade. Um, and every... It, Every one of these lefties that I mentioned, I think this is a fantastic spot for them going after Chris Bassett. Now, that said, this is still Oakland, and this is still a bad offense. 25.5% K rate against righties, 85 WRC+. plus. They don't hit for power, and it's hard for them to hit the baseball over the wall. So that puts Chris Bassett you know, squarely in play because any right-hander in baseball is in play against Oakland. 
but not at 25% of my teams. I want to get leverage with Oakland on the other side. I would not be surprised if Chris Bassett gets blasted here and gives up a real crooked number um, to some of these Oakland lefties. I'm going to have a good bit, and uh, I'm just going to like close my eyes and hope they get there um, because I don't like stacking Oakland, of course, certainly on full game slate, full 10-game slates or whatever. But, uh, you know, we're going to have to have some because this num- these numbers against lefties are just way, way, way too bad. Uh, super, super attackable. Now, he's very good against righties. The the strikeout stuff isn't necessarily there, but, like, look at the Delta. 082 ISO allowed to the righties versus the 331 to lefties. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball versus the 075 to the lefties, right? 20% soft to the, to the righties, 24% hard versus... 15% soft and 37% hard, right, to the lefties. Huge, huge splits here for Chris Bassett this year, and I want to go after that with some of the, it's probably just going to be short stacks that are the most equitable, but throw in Asteria Ruiz. Like I said, if if we're expecting and hoping for, you know, two and three run home runs from, from the lefties down in the middle of the lineup, well, who the hell is going to get on base ahead of them? That's likely to be Asteria Ruiz. Um, and he's got bag upside, so let's do it. So I don't really want a lot of Chris Bassett. I'm going to have some just as a little bit of coverage because if I get blown out, I mean, Chris Bassett could very well throw a complete game here against Oakland, you know what I mean? So I don't want to get totally, uh, you know, totally washed here uh, by fading a righty against Oakland, but I'm going to have a good bit of them on the other side. Uh, So I like offense here, definitely. Um, I think Cap is sneaky in play, but Oakland is as well. Okay, let's move on. Milwaukee and Cleveland. This is another kind of just bleh, sort of game for me. I'm not, I'm not super interested. I don't want to play Wade Miley against Cleveland because he doesn't strike anybody out. Cleveland doesn't strike out. Um, is this a suppression spot for Wade Miley? Like maybe, but he's only going to go five. He's got upside for maybe six innings if he's rolling. And like he would have to give up zero run, maybe one earned run and strike out like four. Or something. I mean, is that in play? Yeah, I, I guess it's within range. But at seven thousand, I'd rather not pay that price tag. I'd rather just not even deal with it, um, and continue with fading both Cleveland and the pitchers uh, on the opposite side. I mean, this is a bad offense, man. Even against lefties, nineteen percent K rate. Yeah, it's great. But ninety WRC plus. They don't get on base. They don't steal. They don't hit the ball over the wall. One forty ISO, sub one forty. Twenty six and a half percent hard contact rate. It's just not attractive with a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball. They're going to hit a lot of baseballs on the ground here. And it's just really not fun to play, to play Cleveland on full slates. Um, now a couple of these pieces are definitely in play price adjusted, right? Ahmed Rosario's in play because you can go after Wade Miley with some righties here, hard contact at 35%. percent 80 ground ball to fly ball there. He'll give up 150 ISO to them with a 13% K rate. Uh, though these are, you know, attackable figures a little bit. He's got a 209 X ISO. So in aggregate this season, Wade Miley probably running a little bit hot, and that would have to kind of put Cleveland in play to a certain degree. You can always play Josie, of course, at 54. And you want to play Josh Bell from the right side? I don't. Like, he's terrible. Um, Gabby Arias, he's a stone min, 2000. You could play that. Or like a David Fry, Miles Straw types down at the bottom of the lineup. Those are fine filler pieces as well, but I don't really want to stack Cleveland. It's super hard to get there with full stacks on full slates. So it's probably just one-off pieces, and for the most part, I'm just kind of like not really interested. Uh, I like Josie and, and Ahmed Rosario, though. I think those are price-adjusted pretty decent plays. Shane Bieber on the mound for the uh, Guardians here, 9400 I think he's too expensive. Like, where are the strikeouts for Bieber, I mean, they're totally gone. We talked about this in most of his starts this year. Everything's gone. 17.5%. This is down seven ticks from last year, uh, and it's to both sides of the plate. He, he's brought in the cutter, heavy cutter value now. He's always had a little bit, but he's throwing a lot more now. And he's really suppressing a lot of the production and thus the strikeout rate to the left side of the plate. He's given up a 182 ISO there and a 290 average. Um, so he's getting hit around a little bit still, but it's still a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball um, with you know average hard contact here at, at 31%. So not super attackable with left-handers, even though, yeah, you could you could 
target a lefty over here, but you need somebody that gets a baseball in the air. That's not Kristen Yelich. That's not really Rowdy Telez, to be honest. And Jesse Winker sucks. So you would you want to eat Rymel Tapia or something like that? I don't want to deal with this. So that puts Shane Bieber in play, I guess. I think he's too popular, though, at 20% ownership. This is a bad offense over here, too, for the Brewers, 88 WRC+. plus. They're going to strike out a 25% clip. Like, he's popped a couple of times this season for some decent strikeout figures, but for the most part, he's striking out four every single start, right? In his last two, struck out five and struck out nine the start before against Houston, just kind of out of nowhere. But before that, two, four, two, four, four strikeouts, Pop for nine against Detroit, but that's Detroit. Let's not get carried away. And before that, four, 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 <laughs> seven strikeouts, three strikeouts. You know what I mean? So it's pretty consistently not there for him this season in terms of raw upside. And at 9,400, that makes it hard for me to eat a lot of ownership on him. It's a, it's a fine suppression spot, and I think this is a decent spot to play some Bieber. I'm not sure where I'm going to come in yet. Because I don't like the price tag, I think the upside is capped. If he gives up two runs here, somehow, to somebody, it, like it's going to be hard for him to make that back up in, unless he goes deep into the game. Now, he does do that, right? Average six and a third per start this season. Still throws 100 pitches like every outing. 68% strike one. It's all great. 29% CSW still, because he gets a lot of called strikes as well. But... um. You know, you need a little bit more strikeout upside and a floor for me to get super excited at this particular price tag. I think he's in play, definitely, um, but I'm not super thrilled about it. And so I don't really want offense on the, on the other side. I think he's a little pricey. I don't really want Cleveland because they're bad, and I don't want Wade Miley. So it's just kind of a write-off game for the most part. Uh, for me here. I don't know. We'll see where I come in later on. Let's move on. Boston and Chicago. I like Brian Bayo here. I think he is a pretty damn good ownership pivot to a guy that we'll get to uh, here in a little bit. Um, I think the projection, media projection here seems a, a tick low for me, to be quite honest. He's very efficient early in the count this season. 64% strike one. That's great. He's got a 350 ERA right in line with where it should be with the XFIP. E X ERA a little bit higher, but like whatever. Strand rate maybe a little bit high. Occasionally can still let the walks uh, take him over. Um... And they can get out of out of control a little bit, so to speak. A little bit here or there. Like, he'll walk five batters or whatever, you know, on occasion. But for the most part, the early career um, walk problems have mostly been solved for him. Uh, he's on the ground here at a really, really high clip. 2-0 ground ball to fly ball. He sacrificed a lot of the strikeout stuff that he displayed early, you know, in his minors career to get more ground balls. Um, but the strikeout stuff to the right side is really still there. 26.5% is really to the left side that he's not striking anybody out because he's main maining a, a two-seamer here, which is not a strikeout pitch. Um, but good four-seamer sinker change value so far. Stri the slider, however, is uh, not good, right? Giving up four outs to the field at a full 20% usage. He's got to figure this out. Um, you know, flatten it out and throw, start throwing a curveball or, or just throw a cutter or something, because you, you can't give up four outs and and expect your strand rate to stay this high, for example. So that's a little worrisome right there. But I think it's a very good matchup. They're likely to have six, seven, maybe even seven righties in the lineup here tonight, the White Sox. Uh, they're, they'll are they have Benintendi, Grandal in there. We'll see. Um, you know, it might not even be Grandal. It could be Seve Zavala. They'll probably have Grandal uh, just for the platoon. But... For the most part, you're looking at like six righties, and all of them just hit ground ball after ground ball after ground ball. They all don't, you know, none of them really have any upside. Luis Roberts, the only one that hits the ball out of out of the yard and over the wall here. Tim Anderson hits uh, like three ground balls per fly ball against righties or something stupid. Um, Aloy Jimenez does the same. I don't really want to pay normal price tags for these guys. Ben Benintendi stinks. Doesn't have any upside for DFS at least. Uh, Andrew Vaughn, like Jake Berger, you want to play these guys right on right when they strike out? I really don't, you know. So I think this puts Brian Bayo in play. 8,400, I'm not super thrilled about the price tag. Would love it if he were like 79, 78, something like that. Uh, but I think at 10, 12% ownership, he's squarely in play because 
And this number is really not going to budge because uh, Musgrove, who we'll get to, uh, he's going to garner all of the ownership in this range, and he's, what, 8,800. So um, I think this puts Bayo in play. It's a pretty good matchup because he's very good against the right side. 2-0 ground ball to fly ball, no line drives, right? 33% hard contact, but, like, I don't really care about that with a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball. 153 ISO with the 26.5% Ks. It's, it's strong. So I want to get to that if I can. Uh, I think this is an upside spot for Bayo. I think the projection looks a little bit low. Giolito on the mound for the Sox. 9,600. Fishy price tag, I think, in this particular matchup. Um, you know, if I got to choose, I'm, I'm just going to play Logan Gilbert. He's not as popular, right? And I think it's a better matchup um, for Gilbert, strikeout-wise, than going after Boston, who doesn't strike out really much at all, right? Um, they've got Jaron Duran, he'll strike out, of course, but Justin Turner, Yoshida, Devers, not so much. Even Adam Duvall doesn't strike out at a ridiculous clip. Casas and the guys down at the bottom will whiff, right? So there's some strikeout stuff there. But platoon-wise, Giolito is a bit more standard, you know, this season, giving up two homers per nine to the left side of the plate. 219 ISO, big number, right? Not so much an average, he just gets on the barrel there with a full 10%. Um... That's a little concerning, right? So many fly balls, though. It makes makes it really hard to get jacked about stacking Boston. Number one, their price tags. Yoshida's 53 still. Devers, 57. Yeah, like, you could play him. That's fine. But I don't want to play Tristan Casas. He's a heavy fly ball hitter, and he strikes out a lot. Um, he'll walk, sure. But Giolito's, you know, his walk problems, not really as concerning as they were last season, for example. So I think he's in play. Um, I'd prefer Gilbert, I think, but I'm, I'm all right. Like we saw with Joe Ryan and, and a good above average arm can do to even a good lineup. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think back to back complete game shutouts are really in the tank for a starting pitcher opposing Boston, but, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's in play. Um, I'd prefer it if he were like 88, 9,000 or something like that, I'd be a little bit more attracted there. Um, but I think he's in play. The barrel rate does concern me. And neutral ground ball to fly ball to the right side, a little concerning there. And he's got a 190x ISO. So a yeah, little little fishy here with an 81% strand rate. Probably about a run's worth of regression coming to Giolito. Not super thrilled about playing against the Sox here tonight. But once again, I don't really want to play them on the other side. It'd probably just be a short stack, Justin Turner, Masataki Yoshida, or a Rafi Devers mix in an Adam Duvall, maybe. Something like that. If you want to do something crazy, get to a five-man. David Hamilton, he's a stone minute shortstop. They just called him up because Kike's been awful. And Connor Wong behind the plate. I think he's a fine play if you get to full Boston stacks, but not really going to go out of my way to do that, I don't think. Pretty far down the list for me. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. Like Bayo. But pretty much off of offense, a little bit of Giolito, I think, maybe. Uh, pieces here or there where they're well-priced. Yoshida, Devers, I think that's fine. Okay, let's move on. Uh, here's the Angels at Coors Field. 6,800 for Patty Sandoval. I just can't do it. If he were 6,300, I think maybe you could consider And I, I suppose because the Rockies are so, so, so bad against left-handed pitching that Patty might be in play at 68 here. 63 WRC+, plus, 27% K rate. It's the line drive rate that really makes it hard for me. Um, they still hit line drives. They don't hit for really any average, at least compared to the average they hit uh, for against righties. All right, they're down at 230 against lefties, 142 ISO, playing all their damn games at Coors Field. I mean, this is just egregious how bad this team is. Um, 32% hard contact really is just average, right? Not impressive. So that would put Patty in play. The problem is he's got a 17% K rate. He just doesn't throw a pass to anybody, and he's got super um, difficulty, I suppose, whenever he gives up any production, earning that back, because he can't throw a pass to anybody. He gets so many ground balls that that's more likely where his outs are going to come from. It's not whiffs. So high ground ball rate here, a, an arsenal that does play at Coors Field, Staying down in the strike zone, heavy slider change mix, right, to both sides. And he stays down with the four-seamer as well. So this would put him in play at very low ownership. It's a pretty shrewd tournament play. Um, I think he's got maybe 18 to 20 in him. But outside of that, I don't really want to do it. I'd probably just rather play the Rockies and 
and hope that maybe the bounce I've been looking for from the 63 WRC plus, uh, you know, rears its head tonight. But I mean, I still respect Patty from a suppression standpoint, but from a uh, a strikeout standpoint uh, and a floor standpoint, if he gives up any production here, even just two runs, he's going to have to go six innings, and he really hasn't been doing that all season, you know. Uh, for this to be a serviceable outing. He's likely to get run support, so you might squeeze an extra four points out of him here. Uh, so that could put him a little bit more in play, but overall I'm just kind of like meh about it. Um, I'm not going to be playing Kyle Freeland, right, on the other side, certainly. Even at 5,000, does, this does put him in play, but I'm just not going to do like deal with it against the Angels and do it at Coors Field. Um, now he got bludgeoned in his last outing against Atlanta, and this is a kind of a similar team. Obviously, the Angels are not nearly as good as Atlanta, but 109 WRC plus with a 165 ISO, 33 and a half percent hard, 260 average that they hit for against lefties. And this is at Coors Field. This is going to play up a lot of these guys' power here. In particular, Taylor Ward, Brandon Drury. He has always hit pretty damn well at Coors Field. Um, going back to his time with the Reds and the Padres and uh, and Arizona as well. Um, Hunter Renfro, this is a pretty good price tag for him and a fine spot for him to kind of get off the schneid. Uh, Chad Wallach has had really good numbers in the short sample this season against lefties. Luis Renjifo, I love playing him. Unfortunate that they stick him down at the bottom of the lineup. but um, And, of course, you know, Trout and Otani go ahead. But, however, right, keep this in mind, Tr- Otani is 6700 today. I think this is the highest price tag we've ever seen for a hitter. I could be wrong. I don't think we've seen a 68. But Otani's right here at 67 now. They're finally just pushing these guys up to where you've got to make decisions. Trout is 65, even though he's been pretty marginal all season. It's a very high upside spot for everybody in the Angels lineup tonight. Uh, You can play everybody top to bottom. And there's plenty of guys down at the bottom that are cheap enough to make getting into a a 6,700 Otani and 6,500 Trout very workable. Drury's 5,000. So, you know, it's not nothing there, but um, certainly attackable and, and very workable uh, getting to Angel Stacks tonight. They're the most popular. you got to balance that, but they're popping well above everybody in value, uh, even considering those two price tags. Um, you know, Shohei and Mike Trout are numbers two and three on the team in value score, which kind of accounts for a little bit for point per dollar, um, you know, which accounts for their salary, of course, right? So considering those huge, huge price tag, that means that's a pretty damn good play. Projected very well tonight, of course, are the Angels. You just got to balance ownership and figure out how you can get different with them. We're not going to be playing Kyle, Kyle Freeland, even at a very cheap price tag. And considering that he got blasted in his last start, um, you might be able to consider a bounce for Kyle Freeland, but he's only going to bounce to about 10 points here, I, I would think. Um, you know, his his best outings have not come at Coors Field this season. He had one. Uh, nope, that was last year. Right, so his, his outings at Coors Field, um, let's see here. He's got one decent outing. That was Washington early in the season. Uh, oh, I was reading this wrong, as a matter of fact. Um, he did have a good outing against Philly and against Milwaukee. Well, Milwaukee's bad uh, at home. Every other outing, though, has been, you know, gulpy to say the least. So can't really go after even a very attractive price tag here with Kyle Freeland. Um, You know, maybe in a super deep tournament stuff, if you land on a Kyle Freeland team or something, just on the off chance he pops for 18 points, um, you know, you'd get ridiculous leverage on the field. Problem is you still got to get there with the rest of your team, um, and, you know, like, you'd have to hope that Toronto gets there or something like that, and, you know, and then you get there with it. So it's a it's super, super low probability play. Um, so I'm not really interested, to be quite honest. Offense, really only, I want to play the Rockies too, like I said. They're cheap enough. They get Zeke Tovar back tonight. Leas Diaz at 4,200. He's fine. You could play Alf behind the plate as well, um, or instead of Elias Diaz. That is uh, 3,100 for him. Ellery's Montero, he's 26, but he's sole first base now, which really stinks. Grichik, I'm not jacked about playing this, but he's fine at 4,000. You know, the, the price tags for all these guys are fine. 
Jerry Profar is down to 36 now, fine. But again, they just don't hit for a lot of power. It's hard to get there with them out in full stacks because they don't hit it over the wall. they got to score a lot, and they just don't do that all that regularly against left-handed pitching. So I want some because Patty pitches to, you know, you didn't strike anybody out, right? So I think that's fine. Um, but, like, eh, it's – I want to play some because they're at Coors Field. But I'm um, really not sure how much I'm going to end up getting, to be honest. All right, let's move on. Washington and San Diego. Patty Corbin, I'm not playing this. We can get through this pretty quickly. 14% strikeout rate, 35% hard contact to the righties, 172 ISO, 321 average allowed, uh, buck 50 ground ball to fly ball, 27% line drive rate. No chance I play Patty Corbin tonight. I'm going to go right back to the Padres. Um even at 6,100, I, I can't do it with, against very right-handed heavy teams with Patty Corbin. Uh, this is a good offense, and they're really, really heating up. So no thanks, uh, and I'm playing Soto too, even though Corbin's been elite against left-handers this year. In the short sample, right, 232 average allowed, 089 ISO. Even, you know, not elite in terms of strikeouts, but he gets he limits production, gets a lot of outs. 180 ground ball to fly ball, really strong there. I want to play some Padres, and we got to keep an eye on their ownership, of course, because if it if it steams, then that probably takes me off, because Patty Corbin's been very serviceable all season, and I like counter trading the market because he's v- still very efficient early in the count, and he can survive. Problem is against very right-handed heavy teams, he still throws the two seamer, right, and it's a horrible pitch only at 92. So this really plays into the strengths of the Padres here from the right side. Tati 66. That's kind of stiff. Um, Machado, 53. That's fine. Bogart should be back tonight. Just got a day off yesterday. 5,100 for him. Gary Sanchez hit a bomb. 4,000. Hassan Kim hit a bomb yesterday as well. 3,800 down at the bottom. Nelly Cruz, 24. He'll make it cheaper. Um, Probably, once again, going to stay off of Jake Cronenworth. But if you're playing full stacks, don't fade the lefties. Certainly don't fade Soto. Uh, or anything like that, because they'd probably still get, if they get there, if the stack gets there, they'd probably still get two ABs uh, against a bullpen. So, um, fine to mix. And Jake Cronenworth's a damn good hitter. I don't play Trent Grisham. Um, you guys feel free. And, uh, you know, that's where I am on that. So, a lot of the Padres offense, no Patty Corbin, and I don't really want much of the Nationals here necessarily, only for leverage purposes, I think, because Musgrove at 8,800, he's seeing 35% ownership right now. Now, I think this makes sense, right? I think it makes sense. Um, this is a good suppression spot. He's an above-average arm. He's super variant, though. Like, we talked uh, about him a few starts ago, uh, last time he was on a main slate at least, that Musgrove's a very streaky arm. And when he starts streaking to the upside, you really want to jump on board because he'll he'll throw together very equitable outings just one after another, bam, 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 and just punch him out. Um, and you get blown out of the water if you fade him. This could very well be a continuation after you know some down matchups. He had Cleveland and he had Tampa in his last two starts, so it's kind of understandable that the strikeout stuff wasn't really there. It's not that he got blasted or blown apart. He, he gave up three runs against Cleveland, still went six innings, struck out five, right? Gave up two runs against Tampa, still went six innings, struck out just a one. So, and it, you know, that's understandable. Those are two difficult teams and two difficult lineups to get through from a strikeout perspective. Tampa's Tampa. Um, Washington is not Tampa. They're more similar to Cleveland, right? So I think it's very well in the tank here for Musgrove uh, to... You know, go a six, even seven innings. He can suppress here for sure. And I think it's more likely that he gives up fewer than three runs, or less than three runs, I should say, um, against Washington because they're a bad offense, right? 87 WRC plus 125 ISO is terrible, right? 18.5% K rate, okay, but they don't walk, right? 150 ground ball to fly ball. Everything is on the ground here for them. There's just no power. They don't get it in the air. And Musgrove gets some ground balls. Right, Still has some whiffs to the lefties, 23%. They are going to platoon here a little bit, so I think that puts him in play. Um, I'm more thrilled with him in cash than tournaments, but he has tournament upside also. I would much rather just come in under in tournaments uh, and play some of the other guys that I like, like a Brian Bayo, for example, at lower ownership. 
Uh, but that does not mean by any stretch that he's out of play here at an 18-point median projection. Big value score, and he's going to pop right at the top for us. Uh, 35 here so far. That's a big number. So I'm fine with Musgrove, and I'm fine with him continuing his sort of upside streak. The price tag is increasing, so I'm not jacked about that. But I don't really have any major concerns here, maybe against a couple of these righties with the lack of strikeout stuff there at 18%. But, like, how many righties are they going to throw at him? Lane Thomas, Joey Manessis, that's it, probably. Maybe one more guy down at the bottom. Um, who knows? So... I think Mus- I think this is a fine spot for Musgrove. I'll probably just come in under in tournaments, um, but not because I don't like him. I, th- I think it's fine, even though I generally don't like going after Washington just because they're a hard strikeout matchup. That's why I'd prefer him in cash. I think he's more likely to suppress than strike out a lot of guys. So I would have maybe some slight upside concerns uh, for tournaments at high ownership. But um, you know, he's very much in play. Okay, let's move on. Houston and the Dodgers. Uh, J.P. France, I want to go after him. I don't want to play him. 7,400, no thanks. Not against the Dodgers. Um, 54, 55% strike one, not all that impressive. 20% chase rate, no thanks. This is a super patient patient team, and you know, like he's going to be throwing it over the plate to these guys. He doesn't have any chase, right? And he's going to give up a good bit of sort of reverse split production here. 260 average allowed so far this year. 351 Wobo with the 250 ISO. 17.5% K rate. Not dealing with that against Dodgers. 36.5% hard contact rate with 075 ground balls per fly ball. North of 21% line drive rate. 2.5 homers per nine. That's probably a little noisy, but like, whatever. Uh, Still the Dodgers. 83% strand rate. Looking for downside regression for him to the tune of about a full run. And the Dodgers are a pretty good offense to make that happen for us. The problem is getting to them due to their pricing. 63 for Mookie, 62 for Freddie, 57 for Will Smith. Like, come on. what is like? You can't full stack these guys and and be comfortable with the rest of your team. It's just insanely difficult. Um, Max Muncy might get him back tonight. We'll see. But he's 5,000 also, and he's hitting 190 on the season. Um, J.D. Martinez, 5,000. He's been great, so I'd prefer him. You know, if I had to choose between like him, Mookie, and, and Will Smith or something, just because he's the cheapest. Uh, but all of them are great from the right side, and you can always play Freddie. And you can play Max Muncy, sure, even though he's been pretty dreadful all year. You're going to have to play if you want to full stack the Dodgers. Some of the guys down at the bottom, whether that's David Peralta, James Outman, um, or Jason Hayward in the outfield. Um, Miggy Vargas you can mix in. Probably stay off of Miggy Rojas, but, you know, so the Dodgers are definitely in play because I want to go after J.P. France. I don't want to play him really at all, even if I don't end up with a lot of the Dodgers due to their pricing. Um, I would like to get as much as I can because I I really don't think J.P. France has all that much upside in a spot like this. He's going to pitch to a lot of contact, I think, and um, I'm looking for some negative regression for him against one of the best teams in baseball. Emmett Sheehan on the mound for the Dodgers, 6,500. He was good in his first start, right, against the Giants. But the Astros are not the Giants, right? And this is not double-A where Emmett Sheehan is coming up from, right? Is he in play at 6,500? Maybe, if you want to take shots on a low um, or an arm with a little bit of upside, sure. Sure. You know, he's got some velo. He's got 96 in the tank with a damn good velo delta on the change. Look at that, 13 miles an hour uh, worth of delta here. And he's got a full three pitches, right? This is fine. Um, But once again, this is Houston, and Houston is not going to strike out nearly the same clip that the Giants were, right, 22.5% versus whatever it is, 26.5% or 25.5%. Uh, against righties for the Giants. 96 WRC plus for Houston, still missing their best hitter, right, of course. But I think these guys are very much playable. You want to go after a young arm here, I think this is all right. I think he's probably too expensive for me to want to take shots against Houston. Um, But if you want to try and just capitalize on some variance and say, hey, he's a young arm, they've never seen him, you know, play this kind of game, uh, I don't think it's horrible. He's going to have trouble getting strikeouts and getting through the top half of the lineup, though, with Josie Altuve, Alex Bregman, Kyle Tucker. Um, Yander Diaz, he'll whiff a little bit, but I think he's a damn good catcher play at 3,000. They might DH him or something, have him in the four-hole. 
finally, now that they've got Josie Abreu, they're moving him down the list because he's terrible. Uh, Jeremy Pena's price tag, finally, down to low 4Ks, 4,200. He's playable now. Um, and Corey Jolks, I like this a, a decent bit if he's in the lineup tonight, 2,600. So we'll see what they want to do at the bottom. I don't want to play the J Jake Myers, Martin Maldonado shenanigans. Uh, no thank you. But I think Houston Sacks are very much in play going after a, a – this is a double-A arm, right? He came up from double-A, and the Giants are kind of a double-A team, to be quite honest. Um, Houston is not, right? They're still probably going to make the playoffs if they don't even – you know, win the division whenever Jordan gets back. Um, but they're right up there in the American League. They're uh, they're still one of the better teams. So this should be a good baseball game here tonight, I think. Um, sneaky offense, if you can make this happen, I prefer stacks of Houston because they're far more attainable to get to. Uh, I really like their price tags. like Bregman, and I like Yonder Diaz a good bit. Of course, Kyle Tucker. Um, and, yeah, you want to play Josie Altuve? 40, yeah, sure, it's fine, 4,900. I think that's uh, that's very much playable. Um, so probably just going to stay off of pitching here. Price tags seem a little bit fishy for these guys on the mound. I want to get to the Dodgers, but, like, good Lord, price tags are fishy for them in the batter's box, too. All right, last game of the night here, Arizona and San Francisco. Kind of a bleh, game, I think. I think I'm just going to leave the Arizona on the shelf tonight against Logan Webb. I'm certainly going to leave Zach Davies on the shelf, too. He just doesn't have any upside for me. Now, he got blasted in his, in his last start as well against Cleveland, gave up uh, a real crooked number. Uh, what was it? Seven earned in – no, it was eight earned in three and two-thirds, sprayed nine hits uh, over the weekend and this past weekend. And I think I want to probably just continue to go after Zach Davies. I've been short on him for like three seasons now. It, and it's starting to really work out pretty well, I guess. Uh, 5,500, though, if you want to play him for a bounce – and mix him in. I mean, we just talked about how bad the Giants were, right? Twenty. Okay, it's twenty-four and a half percent, not twenty-five and a half. I shorted them by a, by a tick. Whatever. They still strike out, and they still don't create a hell of a lot if they're not hitting the baseball over the wall. Now, that's the kind of the problem that we're going to run into with Zach Davies. He pitches to a lot of contact, but it's not over the wall contact, right? He stays off of the barrel. Five percent barrel rate, just a two percent raw homer rate. He's only given up three dingers all season. Now he's he's been hurt. He's got a shorter sample, but right, we just look at these raw numbers. He's got three home runs allowed in seven starts. He's given up half a homer per start. You know, so I don't know. This is in San Francisco at sixty degrees at night. And despite the fact that these guys hit the baseball in the air and there's a little bit of a wind blowing out, it's still 60 degrees in San Francisco. It's a big ballpark. Um, so when they're not hitting hitting it in freaking McCovey Cove, like where's the creation coming from? They don't steal bases. And they got a lot of guys hurt and dealing with some nagging injuries. Lamont Wade, he's got a side that he's dealing with or an oblique or something. Keep an eye out on that or an eye out for that. See if he's in the lineup tonight. I don't really want to play Tyro at 52 at second base, to be quite honest. Uh, Jock Peterson, yeah, I play him against pretty much every righty in baseball. 4,700, that's fine. J.D. Davis, little intriguing here at 4,000. I think this is okay. But Zach Davis, for the most part, been pretty okay against righties this year, even though he does pitch to a lot of contact. Um, I'd prefer mostly the left-handers here. Not super thrilled about playing the Giants. And to be honest, they were hovering about five, slightly over five in the run total in the betting markets here in the early morning here. And somebody came in and whacked them pretty hard. They're down to about four and a half now. Um, so you got to keep an eye on that. They're going to get resistance at the five. And that's usually a pretty strong indicator that a team is unlikely to pop for a, a pretty big number when they see betting resistance at a significant total, like like five runs. Um, so I, I don't know. Kind of lukewarm on the Giants. I'll have a couple of pieces here or there just for, for some late night coverage, I think. But full stacks, I'm not really excited about, to be quite honest. Lamont Wade's a little expensive for me, I think. Um, especially if he's dealing with a, an oblique or a side or whatever. I do like Jock, and I do like J.D. Davis. You'll see what they do down at the bottom of the lineup. I'd rather play like Yiner Diaz in L.A. than Patty Bailey at 300 more expensive in San Francisco. You know what I mean? So, eh, I'm mostly lukewarm on the Giants here. Um Logan Webb on the mound, I do want to play him, I think. I think he's very much in play. This is a difficult matchup, but I really like going after bad teams or bad arms with the Diamondbacks instead of good arms, right? Logan Webb is a pretty good arm, I would say. 25% aggregate K rate this season. 
hell of a lot of ground balls, 2.6 ground ball to fly ball. He stays off of a line, right? There's some hard contact a little bit to the left side, but, like, whatever. He's got two and a half ground balls to fly ball. I don't care if it's only 35%. Doesn't get hit for a lot of average, a little bit more so to the righties, but still a very workable figure here. There's no power, right? And, once again, this is in San Francisco at night. So, um, he's super efficient, 66% strike one, 35% chase. Really, really good changeup, two-seamer change mix here. Uh, super equitable for him. And I think at 10-4, I'd much rather play him than Kodai Senga, i tell you that much. Um, so, yeah, I'm okay with paying, you know, to what, 20, 25% ownership on the guy. Might be able to get a little bit of leverage on the field and get over here. I think this is okay, even though this is a very dangerous lineup to go after. Um, it's still a good matchup for Logan Webb because, I mean, do you really want to play – play Corbin Carroll at 5,800 tonight against a, a good arm in San Francisco? Yeah, probably not. I mean, the ballpark's going to play up his skill set in terms of speed. You know, he hits one in the corner there and triples alley. Like, yeah, he'll run forever. But 5,800, like, you're really paying for that. Jerry Perdomo would probably be my favorite price-adjusted play here, uh, from the left side at least, for the D-backs. I don't really want to pay regular price tag. Can tell Marte at 5,000, no thanks. So, nah. Um, outside of that, don't really want to play any of these other guys, Chris Walker, Lourdes, Mandy Rivera, Alec Tom. I don't want to deal with it. So just give me some Logan Webb. I think he's a, a pretty good play. And I think the ownership here is, um, probably a little bit low. Looks a little fishy low to me, uh, given his underlying metrics. So I, I'm on board with that. Very little offense here, piece here or there, but for the most part, just a, just a good bit of Logan Webb. Uh, okay, so I think that's it for the breakdown. Let's go over a review here. Keep an eye out once again on these top three games or for uh, weather. And hopefully, like I mentioned in those breakdowns, hopefully they just all get rained out and I don't have to deal with them. Um, if, I, if we do have to deal with them, I don't want any pitching here in the first game. Maybe a Dane Dunning here or there, but probably not because of weather. And give me some Texas. I want to go after Clark Schmidt if the game plays. I don't want Kozai Senga. I don't want Taiwan Walker. Some sneaky stacks here, definitely, but like their price tags are really kind of taking me off. I'd prefer the Mets if I had to choose, but the Mets are bad. Um, Philly, probably just short stacks because they're really expensive. So, eh, kind of a write-off. Um, Seattle and Baltimore, I want to play some Logan Gilbert, so I hope this doesn't get rained out you know, in that respect. Because I think it's a very attackable, kind of a sneaky spot here against Baltimore. They, they'll strike out. Uh, at, at the top of the lineup a little bit. Um, and I think Seattle stacks are very much sneaky as well. So of the three, I'd prefer that this game plays because I don't want to play Kyle Gibson. I want to stack against him a little bit, play some Seattle. Hopefully they're getting off the schneid a little bit offensively because they took apart Domingo Herman yesterday. Um, you know, when the guy can't cheat, you know, he ends up giving up eight runs. Who'd have thought? Um, in any case... Hopefully they're they're starting to heat up a little bit. And Kyle Gibson's very much attackable, of course. Oakland, Toronto. I'm going to play some Oakland here against Chris Bassett. I'm going to have some because this is Oakland. Uh, but I really like the lefties here from Oakland a lot. And probably come in under the field on Bassett, I would think. And probably with the field, maybe even over, I don't know, uh, on Toronto against Caprillion. Eh, maybe with the field. Um, I hate stacking against Caprillion, but this is a really good spot for Toronto. Milwaukee and Cleveland, uh, no Wade Miley, I don't think for me. Maybe some Bieber, yeah, he's in play, but like it's the price tag is going to keep me off of a lot of him uh, and some other guys in the range. I, I think I'd rather play. They just have higher upside, namely a uh, Logan Gilbert. Um, Cleveland pieces, sure, against Wade Miley, like a righty here, or there, Med Rosario, Josie Ramirez, something that maybe. Uh, uh, Miles Straw at the bottom of the lineup if he can get on base, sure, I guess. Um, Overall, kind of a write-off game here for me, too. Don't really want any Milwaukee for the most part. Boston and the White Sox. I like Brian Bayo here a good bit. Maybe a Boston piece as well, like Rafi Devers, Yoshida, something like that, against Giolito. I think Giolito's also in play. I don't really want any of the White Sox, to be quite honest. Um, yeah, I'm mostly on Brian Bayo here. I think he's a really good pivot off of Musgrove. Angels, Colorado, uh, Patty Sandoval, and Freeland. I'm just leaving them on the shelf, I think. I don't think I'm going to need or want to get to Patty Sandoval, to be honest. Uh, probably just offense here. A lot of L.A. where I can make it happen. And some Colorado, too. I think those are good tournament stacks. 
uh, whenever there are Coors Field, they're a good tournament stack. Washington, San Diego, maybe a Washington piece here or there, like a, I don't know, Luis Garcia, uh, Corey Dickerson, or something like that. that. But that's pretty much it. Um, I think Musgrove's fine. Prefer him in cash just because of the ownership, and I have upside question marks in this particular strikeout matchup. Uh, but I think he's perfectly in play. Um, but I'd rather play Brian Bayo and pivot if I need to get there or just don't have enough to get all the way up to Musgrove. Houston and the Dodgers, I think Houston is a, a pretty kind of shrewd tournament stack here going after a really young double-A arm here, Emmett Sheehan making his second start in the bigs. Um, I think this is playable, and there are very playable price tags. Dodgers on the other side, yeah, I want to go after JP France too, but um, you know, you got to pay... 85,000 for all of these guys. So uh, that's a little difficult. And last game of the, na- the night here, uh, Arizona and San Francisco. We talked about this. Mostly just Logan Webb here and an offensive piece here or there where they are well-priced. So that's it. We are done. Um, projections and ownership will be pushed all throughout the day once again. Keep an eye out for those updates. And good luck to everybody here on this Friday 10 Gamer.